All right, hello and welcome to another Expert Insight interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you as usual from San Diego. And today I am joined from Boston, a, a snowy, cold Boston by uh, Frank uh, Cespedes. How are you doing? I'm doing well. I wish I were in San Diego in this <laughs> weather, but John, thank you. Sincere thank you for having me on Sales Pop. Oh, absolutely. And Frank is a senior lecturer at the Harvard Business School. He's run businesses, served on boards and startups. He's a prolific author for the um, of articles in the Harvard Business Review, as well as books, uh, many books. I think it's six uh, at this stage. And you have a new one coming out next week, which is called Sales Management That Works, How to Sell in a World That Never Stops Changing. Uh, so, uh, so if, Frank, let's just baseline for a moment, right? In, in a world that never stops changing, so it's always been changing. But there's the feeling, certainly, over the last while, that the the rate of change is increasing, you know, rapidly. And even the pandemic has forced a lot of change. It's maybe accelerated things like, you know, digital transformation and all of that. Is um, how do you assess like the the rate of change and what impact is that having on on people and businesses? Yeah, well, I mean, I, I, certainly I agree, and I agree also with people's felt experience about this, and there is some data and research to support this. First, it is important, you recognize this, but let me call this out, business is always changing, mm -hmm. right? Uh, you know, it's not like change started uh, six months ago, business is always changing, Secondly, there is data to support the instinct that the rate of change is accelerating, especially in the area of business development sales. Mm -hmm. But third, and this is uh, one of the major motivations for the book, John, when I read what people say about the impact of e-commerce, uh, so-called digital transformation, isn't that a wonderfully yeah. conveniently vague phrase, digital transformation? Uh, big data, and so forth, the cause and effect links that they point to are not supported by the data, and I think are often misunderstood. Um, what is changing, and this is the important thing in the uh, uh, nub of the book, the most important thing about selling is buying. Mm -hmm. Who buys, why, and how? That is changing. That is where technology is having its biggest impact. It is an omni-channel buying world. Uh, customers and prospects are online and offline at multiple times in mm -hmm. their buying journey. And that's a big deal. That has implications yeah. for many topics I discuss in the book, hiring, training, sales models, et cetera. Yeah. Yeah, one in, one interesting one that you talk about, you even talk about it during the the introduction to the book, which I, I found fascinating, was that buying is a process of parallel streams, not a linear funnel. And as you rightly point out, we've all grown up on on funnels and and things being linear and all of that. And um, what do you mean by by a process of parallel streams? Well, I mean, let me uh, uh, you know give you an example, but uh, yeah. the quick. The quick point here is that any funnel, any pipeline, you know, all that talk that dominates uh, the uh, talk about sales assumes a sequential process mm -hmm. in how buyers move from, to use the old AIDA model, awareness to interest to desired action. That's just not true, right? Buyers are online, offline, multiple times. An example that I think a lot of uh, folks uh, listening to our conversation can um, relate to buying a car uh, in America. Here's what the data tells you. The average U.S. Uh, car buyer now spends over 13 hours online researching the purchase. You know, they go to um, Edmunds.com, autotrader.com. They find out the wholesale price that the dealer uh, has the car at, etc. They only spend a total of three and a half hours in the actual dealerships. But the vast majority of automobiles, both new and used, are bought in dealerships. And by the way, that continues to be true throughout the pandemic. Now, does this mean the internet is not a big deal? No, it does not mean the salesperson is being 
eliminated or as they say, disintermediated, but it does mean that sales tasks change dramatically uh, because the buyer walks into the dealer already knowing about product, price comparisons, et cetera. And I think anyone who's been in the United States for the last 20 years realizes that buying a car in America has become a significantly more pleasant process for the consumer, but not because dealers went to Bible school, because of the impact of an information rich environment mm -hmm. on buying and therefore effective selling. And, and that's true in, in many, if not most yeah. other categories. Yeah, you know, and I think car buying is such a is such a great example because it is and, and I've been in the States 23 years so I've actually gone through this. I've seen the evolution of car buying um, firsthand and, and you're 100% correct. I mean, when originally back in the day it was you went in and then you had this mysterious strange dance about arguing over what your payment was going to be and the guy would be going running back to the manager to get approved all that good stuff. And now you know how the formulas are put together you know all about the interest rates money factors all of these things so you're more empowered and yes you're using you know when i go buy a car I use a lot of um, online research and stuff and then communicate through email and then just go into the dealership really to conclude the deal and i think that's really interesting because you talk about multi-channel management now and customers are unbundling many traditional channel arrangements as they switch streams. And I think that's a fascinating point. And I don't think a lot of um, sellers have caught up with that concept yet, because I still, I still think we're pretty disjointed. Yeah, and, and I, I, first of all, I think you're right. I base that on the boards I sit on, mm -hmm. companies I work with. Uh, it has implications, obviously, for the sales model. It has significant implications for what data is useful as, a point, as opposed to little factoids, because mm -hmm. online offline interactions are very important. And it has implications for what salespeople have to do and therefore training and development, simple example. But when you're in a multi-channel sales model, which is, you know, forget yeah. these debates about should we be online, offline? This is mm -hmm. now the third decade of the 21st century. The answer to that debate is yes, you got to be both places. But when you're there, notice what happens to salespeople. They, they, they have to move from being individual contributors and still sell, but now they're managing through others. And that mm -hmm. is a big end infamously fraught transition for most sales reps. So it's a, it's a very significant issue. Um, yeah, no, it is. And I think that's, and I think your whole point about not operating in a vacuum is a very good one, because I do think that that's still a frontier that hasn't been well, uh, maybe in many ways hasn't been dealt with appropriately, that there is still, even in a lot of organizations, sales still operates very much as an island. Yeah. Although even there, I think things are uh, changing and, um, uh, you know, you, you'll, you'll see this uh, in the book, but uh, one of the things that the data revolution in sales is doing, uh, and out in your neck of the woods, you know, California, lots of tech firms, Look at these so-called sales operations groups. They're a perfect yep. example of what I'm about to say. If you look at data analytics uh, in, uh, I think it's now about 55% of firms, according to the uh, research I've seen, that those groups don't report up through sales and marketing. They report up through finance. So mm -hmm. now the finance head, the CFO gets this data and two things tend to happen in my experience. First thing is the CFO goes, holy mackerel. You know, I really didn't realize on a uh, fully burdened basis how much money we were spending on sales. <clears throat> and then with the data, you know, CFOs are annoying people. Once they got the data, they start to ask questions. How are you allocating resources? Show me what you get for ROI. One of the implications I see, and I think this is very important for your listeners, because this is going to be true uh, throughout their careers and long after you and I and go to the beach uh, at La Jolla, um, the, the requirements for financial literacy in sales are increasing dramatically. And look, you and I both love sales, but let's face it, most sales leaders, once you get beyond top line volume, 
don't really know that much about return on invested capital, yeah. cost to serve. Those days are passing in a hurry. <clears throat> yeah, I, I would agree with you, Frank. I, I've been talking about this for a while about the uh, importance of business acumen because, yeah, once upon a time, uh, salespeople they they basically focus on top line revenue and nothing else, right? You know, they didn't really care, didn't know about what happened, um, you know, below the. Um, below the line and all of that. And and many times, as you said, companies were never very good even at calculating how much time, effort and money was going into sales because people were pulling on resources from other departments and all of that. And I think that that is the point that that's you can't continue to operate in that fashion that you have to understand, you know, the business of business if you're going to successfully sell to people. Yeah, but but if I can say it is also yeah. a two way street and, mm -hmm. you know, I, I literally I think it's in a week or two have an article coming out in Harvard Business Review about this. But on the other side of the street, <clears throat> fewer people than ever before, this is the data, fewer people than ever before <clears throat> have now made it to the C-suite, including CEO, with virtually no sales and marketing experience in their background. They are increasingly out of touch with what goes on with their customer-facing colleagues. And you know, the example I use every time I work with the C-suite, I'm going to use some business school jargon, but I hope that's yep. okay. That's fine. Scope is the term that's used in strategy to talk about the decisions that every company must make about where they play and where they don't play. And I always tell the C-suite, you know, listen, folks, scope is not something that's determined by you getting together with your senior colleagues and discussing it. That's called brainstorming. Mm -hmm. Scope is determined by the call patterns of your sales force. How much do you know about the call patterns of your sales force? And frankly, the response I typically get from C-suites is, good question, Frank. Well, mm -hmm. I mean, get on it. And then, by the way, now's the time to get on it, uh, you know, while we're still trying to recover from this economic yeah. mm -hmm. uh, uh, catastrophe of the pandemic. Yeah, and it's interesting also what you talk about with 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 people and you know salespeople and hiring, and the idea of and I think this is a really critical one is I think we have to better define what salespeople need to do now and the different types of roles within sales and as you say then hire to the role rather than let's face it the the uh, the traditional way often of hiring salespeople is you hire somebody who wows you rather than looking, do they have a particular skill set for this particular role? Yeah, no, I agree. And, you know, that was my other major, major motivation with this book, John. I mean, one of the things that's always fascinated me, and I must say, as somebody, you know, who's run a business, done a couple of decades of research about this topic, it, it sort of offends me intellectually. But of all the various functions in business, sales is by far the most context specific. Selling software is different than selling capital mm -hmm. goods. Selling enterprise software is different than selling software as a service. Selling in North America is different than selling in Asia or the Middle East, et cetera. Mm -hmm. And yet sales is also that area of business where people feel most comfortable making these broad, and I would consider them vacuous generalizations, right? Um, so I think this is important because sales is so context dependent, you start with the sales task. And that sales task is very dependent on your strategy, where you choose to play, where you don't, uh, et cetera. And frankly, both data and the changes in buying, to your point, are making this a bigger and bigger issue for companies. Yeah, so it's fascinating because if you, if any time I have a conversation with somebody who's uh, who is just running another business or you know, higher players in the C-suite of another business, the one issue that everybody agrees with, and it's almost a constant, that finding good salespeople is almost impossible. It's the hardest thing in the world. And I've often wondered why it is, why, why is it so hard to find good salespeople? Is it because of what you've just been saying here? The fact is we kind of go about this process the wrong way. 
Well, I think uh, as with most big issues in business, there's no one secret sure. answer, right? The, the complexity is there. But as with most of these issues, you work on both the supply and the demand side, right? Now, let me start with the demand side. Um, hiring in sales presents challenges that are relatively unique compared to most other functions. Um, if you want to hire an engineer, you can go mm -hmm. to an engineering school and it's like walking in a buffet. What do you want? electrical engineering, chemical engineering. You're looking for someone in finance or accounting. You find people who majored in those subjects. Same is true mm -hmm. with software programming. Yeah. But let's use the US as an example of the something like 4,600 colleges and universities in this country. And <clears throat> last time I looked, less than 200 even had a sales course, mm -hmm. let alone a sales program. So. A, most salespeople begin their careers basically totally unprepared for what they're doing. And here's another factoid. It turns out that uh, no matter what your major was in college, you know, whether it was business administration or art history, more yeah. than 50 percent of college graduates will at some point in their career work in sales. Mm -hmm. So the point is that companies do need to train, develop, and they do. They spend more, 20% more per capita on sales training than they do in other areas. But the issue with hiring also has a supply side dimension. And what I'm about to say is as close to an established fact about management as anything that you will ever hear from a business school professor and yet most executives have trouble getting their head around this. The correlations between the evaluations people get in their interviews and their actual on-the-job performance vary from about 0.1 to 0.4. In other words, less than the 50-50 rate of flipping a coin. And it's significantly lower in sales because it is so task dependent. Mm -hmm. And because in sales, you know, the market changes. Uh, there are things outside of your control. So A, you've got to supplement interviews. Selling is about behavior. It's not about how charming they were in the interviews. If you're gonna use assessments, understand what they are mm -hmm. and are not good for. And at the end of the day, and ironically, the pandemic is creating more opportunity for this last point, at the end of the day, because selling is about behavior, you want whenever possible to put in place, in effect, probationary period types of um, uh, activities. Uh, all of that, it's a big issue, but it's also a complex issue. If it were simple, yeah. you know, smart people would have solved that years ago. It has both dimensions. Yeah, no, no, I, um, <clears throat> excuse me, I couldn't agree more on, on that. And it is, um, and, I, and I do think it's something that, uh, that companies need to address and look at, because let's face it, I mean, the, the amount of money you lose by hiring the wrong person and all the investment in that is, uh, you know, adds up significantly over time. But the other part that you mentioned there is about, okay, so even if you get your hiring somewhat better, uh, you need to train and you, you need to invest in the training of, of salespeople. And it often seems to me, and I you know, ran sales performance improvement company for a while, um, a number of years back, is there's very few companies who proactively do this, right? They don't bring in and train their people or whatever when things are going well. They wait till there's a crisis and then they say, come in, fix this to help my people. And that just seems backwards to me. It always has. Yeah, well, it is, you know, and it's like the, um, and again, this still remains true. The, the same thing happens with advertising expenditures, right? I mean, you look at the research, advertising expenditures go up as a percent, because they're set as a percentage of sales, they go up when business is good and they go down when arguably you need it the most, when yeah. business is bad. And I think you're right. In uh, broad terms, there is that same phenomenon with uh, sales training. But even beyond that, companies, again, are still spending a ton of money 
on sales training. When you look at the aggregate, the amount of money that's spent hiring and training salespeople, in most firms, it's actually bigger than some of their biggest capital expenditure decisions. But historically, it doesn't get the same rigorous attention. I'll give you some examples. Um, you know, the, the predominant mode of sales training is still some variation on classroom training. And we know this, again, <clears throat> these are the facts. Most reps forget 90% of what they learn in a training seminar <clears throat> within 90 days. That's real, you know, quarterly short-termism. Secondly, how do salespeople learn? They are a classic example of what the learning theorists call modeling behavior. Mm -hmm. Salespeople learn this much from trainers or professors. They learn this much from looking at the best of their peers. And what do they do? They say, hey, I hadn't thought of that. That's a great way to deal with that objection or frame that product, et cetera. And the last point is they learn when they need to learn. It's very mm -hmm. task oriented when they're on their way to make a call or even during the sales conversation. Now, here's the good news. Here's where technology is the seller's friend. There are more and more technologies out there that do allow companies efficiently and effectively to do what I would call just-in-time training or what some other people call learning in the flow of work, which is especially crucial in sales. But to your point, it's still an underutilized resource. More mm -hmm. companies really need to take advantage of this and they will, but uh, you're, you're in effect incurring opportunity costs when you don't. Yeah, no, no, a hundred percent, and I totally agree with you. And uh, that uh, you know, having having done this myself in the past, is absolutely if if uh, if the sales training is going to be a almost like a, a an event, right, a one off event, and you get everybody in, you train them, um, that's great. As you said, you might take away 10%. Maybe you get a little bit of improvement. You'll always get some people who are more motivated than others who will, you know, take it on themselves. But generally speaking, your results are going to be pretty patchy. It's and, not and until think, it's not yeah. until it's embedded and coached on an ongoing basis. And to your point about modeling, if your sales managers and stuff don't uh, uh, don't um, reinforce this and model this behavior themselves, you're not going to follow it. Yeah, and you know, let's use a pandemic as uh, mm -hmm. as a good example. Um, you know, the uh, the pandemic has not been an equal opportunity plague, right? Yeah. There are some businesses, some tech businesses, where this is actually they got lucky. This has actually been good for them. How are you and I talking? Yeah, right, exactly. But there are other businesses. I'm going to use that wonderful uh, gangster movie term <laughs> that have just been whacked, right? Uh, yeah. You know, we're in service dominated economies. 70% of US GDP is in services. That's why this pandemic is a catastrophe. But the point is that certain businesses have been hurt much more than others. So when you read all these, I think, if I can be blunt, very yeah. silly and simplistic new normal projections that come out every day, <laughs> most of them are based on silly stuff straight line extrapolations of what goes on when stores are shut and people are afraid that if they go shopping, they may die. Well, of course, mm -hmm. you're gonna get some more online sales, but actually a lot less than um, uh, the new normal projections site. The point is the most important data in situation like this is account data, who buys why and how. And in most companies, that data is locked up right here in the head of the individual reps. It only becomes apparent when the sales leader does good performance and account reviews. And this is the important thing because you know busy sales managers, most of them do what I call drive-by reviews that are yep. really about compensation or you know, hey John, sell better. Wow, I didn't yeah. realize. Yeah. That. <laughs> Sell more. <laughs> yeah, sell more. Ooh, what a great idea. When sales leaders do drive-by reviews like that, they're not only perpetuating a culture of underperformance, they're inhibiting 
the flow of vital data, especially in conditions like this. Yeah, no, I th I think that's a fantastic uh, that's a fantastic point uh, point Frank because yeah, uh, and as you say, I mean I would love to outlaw that new normal phrase because uh, uh, talk about being overused and and meaning nothing really, um, but I think to your point is that I think this is probably the key to all of this going forward is that um, sales management has to look at things differently. And that's obviously, you know, a lot of the reason why you wrote your book here, because I mean, it's it's critical because um, for me, sales managers are your greatest revenue multiplier, because if they're, do if they're doing what they should be doing, then they will get better performance out of their people. Yeah, and I, I all I would add to that uh, is it it's not only important for um, maximizing profits and enterprise mm -hmm. value, and by the way, Unlike some other people, I don't think that's anything a company has to apologize for, no. right? But there's a big social impact here. Peter Drucker, you know, the great Peter yep. Drucker wrote about this 30 years ago. And Drucker pointed out that in services dominated economies like the US and most other uh, industrial nations, productivity is a big issue. Services productivity has always lagged. And we know now for a fact that productivity uh, has lagged in the United States now for 20 years. Drucker 30 years ago said, if we don't learn to deal with this, we're gonna have increasing inequality, class warfare, and it's gonna hurt democracy. Boy, does that sound mm. prescient, right? Sure. And Drucker used sales as an example. Uh, and that's my point uh, in this book. It's not only a profit maximizing vehicle, it is an engine of economic growth, and that has social impact, not only on the millions of people who sell, but when an economy grows, good things happen in society, and when it doesn't, as we have seen, bad things happen. So, you know, you can go to Davos and talk about stakeholders all you want. My advice to most leaders is look homeward and make yes. sure you take care of things in the house as well. Yeah, no, uh, that's a great place for us to finish up, Frank, and I would a uh, thousand percent endorse that. I think that people should look more locally, more in their own businesses, the impact they're having in, in their communities, whether that community is local or whether it's a virtual community or whatever, because we can have so much more impact there. And then, as you say, as you can, then, you know, pontificating at Davos or just sitting on a Friday evening with a glass of wine and pontificating about the great issues of the world that we have zero control over. You're much better focusing on where you can make an impact. And if everybody did that, I think we would turn all this situation around pretty fast. Yeah, I, I, I agree with that. For me, that's the, the, the people and institutions I've known in my life haven't been the ones making, you know, the uh, fancy speech. Uh, they're the ones who are actually helping people get uh, more productive in their activities. I agree with you entirely. Absolutely. Well, listen, the, uh, the, book, the book comes out next week. It's Sales Management That Works, How to Sell in a World That Never Stops Changing. Uh, Frank Cespedes, Cespedes is the author. I would really encourage people to check out this book. I think this is such a vital subject. Uh, and I think if there's, if there's one area, if you were focused on one area coming out of this pandemic, I think sales management, you, do a, you could do a lot worse than focus in on that. Um, because as we know, the tenure of sales management tends to be high turnover, tends to be um, a, a lot of failure rates in there. And a lot of the times that's not the fault of the people or whatever, it's, a, it's the fault of the approach, the infrastructure, the training, all the things that we talked about. Um, so Frank, just before we go, is there anything you wanna add about your, your book that launches next week? Uh, yeah, it's available, but um, you, you know, uh, publishers have their own uh, form of marketing. They, uh, they keep things in pre-order because mm -hmm. apparently there's an algorithm on Amazon that you want to sort of game. The book is available now. It's available on Amazon. It's available on Goodreads. Uh, when stores open, it's available there. And you can contact the press directly for volume discounts. And interestingly, if you're running a, a sales organization for customization options, what the heck, you might as well get some branding benefits for your firm as well. John, yeah. thank you very much for letting me make that pitch. I appreciate it. 
No, of course, of course. I mean, I would really encourage people to, to check, check it out. It's all of Frank's information will be below this video. We'll also have links to this book and all the other books as well. Um, so I encourage you to check that out. John Golden says, Pop Online Sales Magazine, Pipeliner CRM. I will see you all for another interview really soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.